you so much. Um, it's great to be here, and yes, a leader can get very nervous. Um, so I am nervous because English is not my first language, it is my third language. I also speak Chinese Cambodian. Um, and when I get nervous, I tend to swear a lot. <laughs> so I will try not to do that in English. Um, with that said, it's great to be here. I love this quote by George Bernard Shaw that said, life isn't about finding yourself. It's, life is about creating yourself. I believe this is the same for leadership. I believe leaders are not born but are created. Created by our choices, our decisions, our actions, our commitments, our strategies, our life, our work. There was a time when I could not have ever imagined that I could stand here one day talking about leadership and talking about myself as a leader. Growing up, leaders in my world, in my community, were people who were larger than life, who were on televisions, newspapers, and movies, who had fame and fortune and a loud voice. I have that. But none of them sounded or looked like me. I came into the world where girls were raised to be seldom heard and rarely seen. I came to the world in Cambodia in 1970 when much of it was already embroiled in wars, fought in different places over the world. And in Cambodia, war would come to us, our small little nation and its seven million people. But for the first few years of life, I had the experience of experiencing joy and love and family. My Cambodia was not and would not become this infamous killing fields for many years. My Cambodia was a country that was so green that to this day I've yet to find that green crayon in the box of 64 to fill in its scenery. My Cambodia had a 2,000 year old history of arts and music and culture and that built the largest religious complex in the world, the Angkor Wat temples. My Cambodia where I came into the world was populated not by seven million people only, but by my two loving parents, three rowdy sisters, and three very loud brothers. My fondest memory of childhood was of going to the theater where in the dark my family of nine would sit all in a row and I would just bounce my chair and myself in my father's lap and in my hands I would have my junk food of choice fried crickets, much crunchier than popcorn. <laughs> I have to say, since returning to Cambodia, I have acquired a taste for fried tarantulas. They're kind of like tater tots. <laughs> Crunchy on the outside, spidery in the middle. And if you have a fear of spiders, you eat them. Fear gone. <laughs> that was my childhood. My father, when I got bored of holding my food and drinks, I just gently tapped his hands, and without any verbal communication, he would turn his palms upward, and I would put my food and drinks in his hands. In Cambodia, we didn't have cup holders. <laughs> but you know, when you have parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, there are no need for cup holders. <laughs> my father's lap was my chair, his arms, my armrests, his hands, my cup holders. I thought my life was charmed. And that charmed life would come to an abrupt end on April 17, 1975, when the Khmer Rouge communist Khmer uh, soldiers stormed into my country. I was five years old. The soldier came with their guns and grenades and started screaming for us to leave the city, telling us the city was going to be bombed and if we didn't leave, we would all be killed. My city, Phnom Penh, populated by two million people, was evacuated in 72 hours. To this day, many of us are still trying to find people we lost those many years ago. And in that evacuation, an estimated over 20,000 Cambodians would die from this. But I thought I was lucky because my family and I were together on that day and so we left. 
with the millions of other Cambodians all over the country. And from that day on, my life would become stranger than fiction, where every day consisted of only Mondays, and every Monday a work day. Whether you were six or 60, it didn't matter. Everything I had known in my former life, going to the movie theaters, going to concerts, going to temples, going to school, was banned, abolished, taken away from us. And we couldn't speak up. We couldn't protest. We couldn't scream. The soldiers moved us to live in villages that were more akin to labor camps, where we worked every day, dug trenches, grew food that would be trucked away and came back with munitions, munitions and guns to fight a war we didn't vote in. We didn't want, we didn't know what it was about and we couldn't scream, and we weren't allowed to fight. For in this Cambodia, this new country, anybody and everybody who disagreed with the Khmer Rouge, this new government's policy, laws and rules and philosophies were deemed as traitors and enemies of the state. And their solutions to deal of how to deal with these enemies of the state was to crush and purge them. So as we lived in fear, they sent out soldiers. And in the first wave, they collected the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the singers, the writers, the musicians, people who were leaders in our communities before they took over the country. And they had these people executed en masse. And still, everywhere they looked, they saw more enemies. They fear more people could rise up, could speak, could fight, could say this is wrong. And they sent out more soldiers. And this time they collected the students, the teachers, the parents and brothers and aunts and uncles and wives, the people they've killed and they had these people executed. I was seven years old when I knew that to survive, I had to become dumb, deaf, mute, blind, invisible, just so I could have the privilege of taking that next breath to live, to be alive. And yet I lived in fear with every breath. For well, I knew that my father, being a former military officer, and the fact that my mother is Chinese and my father is Cambodian, and so we were mixed race as a family, made us targets in this new country, made us not pure. For the Khmer Rouge took over the country with this vision to create a new utopian agrarian society where power would be taken from the elites and leaders and given to the poor and peasants, those who they believed were true revolutionaries. And anybody who didn't look like that, who didn't speak that language, who they believed didn't believe in that, were traitors. And so I silenced myself. For as long as I live, I will never forget the day the soldiers came for my father. They came with their excuses that they needed him to go remove an ox cart stuck in the mud. My father talked to my mother, and she started sobbing. And when he came out of our thatch roof hut, one by one he picked up my brothers and sisters in his arms and held them for a moment. And when it came to be my turn, I somehow had the instinct of heart to wrap my arms around my father's shoulders, to rest my face at that perfect nape of his neck, to remember my feet dangling in the air as his arms tightened around me. Because I knew I would never see my father again. He put me down and walked off into the sunset with the soldiers on either side of him. And that night, 
The gods had painted the sky this palette of magenta and gold and red. And it was so beautiful, so magical. But all I can remember was the hate in my heart, the rage, the hurt. And I asked the gods, how could there be beauty in our world if there was only hell in my land? I was seven years old. For the next three days, I didn't pray for my father to escape the soldier's grasp. I didn't pray for the war to end any day now. I asked the gods to have mercy on my father and to make his death quick and painless. I do not know what happened to my father to this day, but this I know, having returned to Cambodia over 30 trips, that our country, the size of the state of Oklahoma, is today littered with over 20,000 mass graves. Over a million loved ones, some of these fathers and brothers and sisters and daughters have been accounted for in these graves. Many of them were killed with a blunt instrument smashed to the back of their heads. For in this Cambodia, Munitions and guns were used on traitors, on, on soldiers in a war, not on traitors. I was seven years old when I knew what hate felt like. Three months after we had told, been told that my father had been executed, my mother gathered us around and said, we have to leave her, to walk east, to go north, to travel south, find an orphanage, don't come back, tell the supervisor of the orphanage that she was dead already. And when I didn't want to go, she turned me by my shoulders, pushed me out the door and said, get out. I thought my mother was weak. I thought she didn't love me. I thought my father kept us together and here she was pushing us out the door. It would take me many more years to realize that my mother was the strongest person I know. And that it was her courage and love that saved us. But off I went, not yet eight years old, full of rage and anger and hate. And when I showed up at that orphanage, the supervisor saw me and didn't tell me hate will only breed hate. They didn't take me aside and said, to be a leader in the world, you got to think differently. you got to heal your heart. You have to lead peacefully. Instead, they put guns half my body's height, a third my body's weight, and taught me to hurt and hate and kill. And then when I was tired, they took me and put me in their schools where they had supervisors and instructors who told me that people out there were bad that people wanted to harm me, that if I and when I do come across them, I have to take them out first to save myself. And there were moments when I believed this, when I believed that the world was full of darkness. A year after I left my mother, the soldiers came for my mother and four-year-old sister. What kind of enemies of the state does a wife and a four-year-old girl make? She was four, too young to leave my mother's side, too young to know how to find food, too weak to fight for herself. And so I went on being trained, filling my heart with hate and wanting to hurt others just because I thought maybe that could make me feel better. I am so fortunate that my war ended on January 7, 1979, when I was nine years old. Because had it not, I have no doubt that I would have be become a very efficient killer, as I am today and a human rights activist. A year later, after the bombs 
and the four years of Khmer Rouge genocide that would see 1.7 to 2 million Cambodians die from starvation, diseases, executions, and labor, hard labor out of 7 million people, almost a third of the population. My oldest brother, sister, and I would find ourselves in America. We didn't know anything about America. At the refugee camps, the refugee workers would show us films about Americas. And these films had plot lines that took in places in cities, big cities like Dallas or Chicago, New York. And we looked at it, we're like, yes, America, a chance at a new life. And they told us we were going to this place called Vermont. <laughs> Statistically, the whitest state in America. For more diversity, I eventually moved to Maine, <laughs> the second whitest state in America. But it was Vermont. I was 10. I didn't speak English. I didn't know anything about this place. And I wanted to know, I wanted to go back to Cambodia someday and make a difference. But first, I had to learn English. And unfortunately, it was the era of the Valley Girls. You had to start all your sentences with, duh, and end them all with, gag me with a spoon. I would occasionally throw in, gag me with a chopstick, because English doesn't make that much sense to me. And there were so many different things. What, what is it with meatloaf? Why, you know, any kind of food where you have to add ketchup to it to have a taste. And, and Uncle Ben's minute rice? <laughs> and worst, worst, what is yogurt? <laughs> it has the consistency and the appearance of baby's burp. <laughs> but it was also in Vermont, with my choice and my chance of life, that I met people like Linda and George Costello, whose act of leadership was to teach me English. And then our, my teacher, Ella Severance, whose act of leadership was to encourage me to write. These extraordinary agents of change helped me find peace in my heart and little by little allowed the hate and hurt to melt away. And with their support, I was able to finish high school, go to college, graduated from college, become an American citizen, find, a re find rewarding work as an advocate in a domestic violence. All along, I stayed silent. I did not rock the boat. I want to become a good person, a good citizen. Leaderships to me were people who were targeted, killed, and people who were connected to them were targeted and silenced. I didn't want that for me. But then I went to Cambodia in 1995, 15 years after I left, and I saw that just because you leave war, war does not leave you. And for me in America, it came back in my nightmares. It came back in the low kick of a car's engine. It came back in the loud roar of a flying plane. It came back in a mother's hums, a father's song. And when I went to Cambodia, I saw that the wards were still in the land. And I met all these beautiful souls with resilient spirits and beautiful smiles who were missing part of their limbs, their arms, their legs, their face, their chest. And when I asked them how and why, they told me about these little weapon system called anti-personal landmines. The size of a hockey puck, a compact powder. Once in the ground, they stay active for decades. And when you step on a mine, everything below you. Rocks, dirt, toenails, grass, bones become like secondary missile, shooting up into your limbs, disintegrating your flesh. And if you survive, it's a lifetime of scars and pain. But had I stepped on a mine when I was a young girl, and I survived, every six months, eight months, a year, if I was lucky, I would have to, have to go to a center and have my limbs cut and recut and cut and recut again until I stop growing. Because your stumps will heal but your bones will continue to grow. For children who survive mind blasts, it's a lifetime of pain and scars revisited. I knew then I wanted to do something to rid our world, my nation, of landmines, where there are over 45,000 amputees. 
But to do that, I would have to return to the war field. I would have to go back to Cambodia. And I didn't know I could do that. I was scared. I was insecure. I was afraid. And I had to make a choice. Do you live in fear or do you choose to stand up and raise your voice? And I chose to stand. And I did this because I realized how hard survivors of wars like my, myself, how much sacrifice went into their survival, what my parents did, and how enraged they would be to see now that my siblings and I were having a hard time surviving the peace because of landmines. I am very fortunate to have made that decision even though I made it with fear. And from that decision, I learned this. The human heart is the strongest muscle in the body. For as much time as it will break, it has the ability to heal. And the second thing I learned is that there are a lot of good leaders in the world. There are a lot of good people in the world. In the US alone, there are over a million charitable organizations registered. And the third thing I've learned from being a human rights activist, from meeting people like George Costello, from meeting people here, is that even though I've seen the worst of man's inhumanity to man, which made the hate and hurt in my heart grow, in the work that I do, in the love of my mother, in the strength of my father, in the kinship of my siblings, in the grace and work and gratitude and generosity of the American people and of the charities I've been involved with, I have also witnessed the best of man's humanity to man. This is what heals. This is the kind of leadership we can do on a daily basis. Wherever we go, whoever we are, in whatever capacity and abilities and time frame, the best of man's humanity to man is in all of us. We only have to choose it. And this leadership will make our world a better and a safer place for all. Thank you.